So, my name's Sarah Johnson. I'm the head of scripted productions uh, department at Kesha in the UK. And the name of this panel is Get Inspired. So, it is my pleasure to invite to the stage some very inspiring people. The first one is the creator of the hit show, Heroes. This show broke not only ratings records, but set the bar high for multi-platform storytelling when it won the Primetime Emmy for Interactive Television in 2008. Since then, this person continues to develop both primetime shows, such as Touch, starring Kiefer Sutherland, alongside interactive and multi-platform series. Please welcome Tim Kring. Okay, so joining Tim on stage is the creator, writer, and director of the is very successful Israeli drama, Khatufim. He co-created and is executive producing the critically acclaimed Emmy and two-time Golden Globe winner drama series, Homeland, based on prisoners of war. He was born and raised in Jerusalem. Please welcome Gideon Raff. Hello. And our last participant was also raised here in Jerusalem and even grew up with Giddy. She created, wrote, and directed the drama series Yellow Peppers that won the Israeli Emmy for Best Drama in 2011. And her second series will be aired very soon. Please welcome Karen Magalit. Okay, so we're oh look, standing up, we're good. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi. It's very exciting to have you all up here. And very exciting um, to be here. We're here to uh, going to take you on a journey of your working lives um, about the things that have inspired you from before you started doing what you do and uh, all the way through to where you are now. I have a little known fact for everybody out there. Now, these people are pretty impressive, obviously, but uh, it's the little known fact is that if you ask three extremely impressive people who are really good at what they do, what inspires them, and you do this on email having never really met, well, at least two of them before, they scatter like a, like a lion in a herd of wildebeest. They scatter, yikes and eek, and you kind of, I was like, oh, God, what have I done? Okay, but then they calmed, and they found, and they did it. And, it's a big question. I know it's a big question. And we're going to take more than that time because I don't think we can fit in everything I want to know uh, in that time. Um, I'm going to start with a quote from uh, Goethe, which I think is great. Is one can be instructed in society, one is inspired only in solitude. Now, to some degree, that's true. But something must have started it for all of you from before you became writers. And I'm interested actually to know what it was, when it came, and Tim, you have, I'm gonna start with you, because you just grabbed me out there with two more, because the, the, the ideas are constantly coming as well, because it's such a big canvas. Oh, it's uh, a, a very difficult, I mean, it's a almost impossible question to answer, because I think you, you know, you, you are, um, you know, you're sort of like a, a sponge or a crow, <laughs> picking up little pieces of things here and there your whole life and never quite sure where you're going to, you know, what, which part you're actually going to draw from. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's, um, I, I think I was, when you talked about solitude, I, I was a very internal person, you know, growing up. I was in my head a lot and very kind of dreamy and spacey. And, and um, I think that, uh, a lot of daydreaming actually is a kind of stock and trade that you end up learning to use. And being a writer is such a solitary experience anyway that there's something very comforting in going back to those places where you're just completely um, internal. But uh, I remember being very influenced by music. And I think maybe because of that sort of internal uh, idea, there were no it was hard to put words to why you were inspired by a song or why you were inspired by a soundtrack. Um, it was a, more of a, of a feeling and more of a, uh, you know, an intuition. And I think a lot of my, um, you know, it's always been very hard for me to articulate what, what I'm 
you know, what I draw from because uh, I think I go into most situations, you know, saying I feel rather than I think. And, um, and so I've learned to kind of just trust these kind of gut intuitions. About I mean, I mean I, it is deeply unfair of me to be sitting asking you, but it is the question that if, you know, I, I'm asking you questions that genuinely I'm interested in the answers because I think that's the point, that we have this platform here to ask all three of you who make amazing stuff out of your heads and nothing else that rips your heart apart and, you know, brings all of that. You mentioned okay. two projects to me outside, which yeah, really... Yeah, well, let me, but, but be, when I was talking about music, let me just give you a, a, one example of something that I, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche to talk about the Beatles, right? But I was of that generation when they were very, you know, it was very influential. But I, I, there's, there's another aspect to the Beatles that I sort of think is, is important. Um, it's, the, it's the duality or the dichotomy of the Lennon, uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney, the one, that, the one that's very uplifting and then the one that is always the voice of, of kind of um, reality or, or, um, or don't, you know, don't get too high off the ground, come back down to, down to earth. And um, funny enough, I actually think about Lennon and McCartney, McCartney um, sometimes when I, when I write, because I think when certain scene, even down to like scene work, when a scene becomes too, sort of too overly earnest or overly optimistic, uh, um, you try to come at it again, you go, okay, well, it's sort of turned a little into McCartney, I need to add a little, a little John Lennon to this. And um, it's something that we've even talked about in the writer's rooms that I run, that uh, we, we talk about the Lennon and McCartney of, of a story. We need, more, we need more McCartney in this story. And it's, it's become a kind of a, a lexicon, you know. Lovely. Um, I also want to say, please feel free, because I know that Karen and Tim, I don't think you've met, but, but you know, this is not just me having to do this. If you've got anything you want to add at any point, please feel free. But go, you were going to talk about Decagog, which is one of those things. I will I come to you guys. I don't want oh. to monopolize, but I definitely no. want to okay. hear about that. I, I had mentioned, uh, I, I brought up this, this, um, this uh, I, I guess you, it was a mini-series. It was called The Decalogue by uh, Kieslowski. Um, and I saw it when I was in, um, I guess I'd just gotten out of film school when I saw it. And I think it's been something that has influenced me as much as anything else that I can think of. For those of you who don't know, it's 10 one-hour episodes made for, I guess, for Polish television. And it was loosely based on the Ten Commandments. So that each, uh, each episode was one of the Ten Commandments in a parable-like story. Um, the problem was you, you didn't really know which one it was when you were watching it. So at the end of each episode, you could kind of debate, well, was that thou shalt not kill, or was that thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife because he had the affair, but then there was the murder, and you know, it's a, so uh, there, there was that aspect. It was the, the ability to sort of debate afterwards that I, I really like. But what ended up happening is as the story progressed, you began to realize that these lives, that was all took place in one uh, apartment building, and it was all these interconnected lives, you started to see that the lives of one person would start to influence somebody else. And someone who you got to know very well in one episode, in, in fact, very intimately in one episode, would then, five episodes later, just get into the elevator with that character. And you had that feeling of, like, I know everything about that person. And, um, and yet they just made a passing kind of glance through the story. And I just remember being very affected by that idea, and I think you can see remnants or, or some of that in, in my work where I dealt with a lot of interconnectivity. I'm seeing the strings in Heroes and that room. Um, Karen, what's in, Tim, Tim gave me lots and lots and lots of things that had inspired him in quite, in quite broad terms. Giddy gave me the longest list and then kept adding to that list, including some very, including the Bible. Um, and Yentl, as a joke, but... Yentl um, was a joke, you weren't supposed to say <laughs> I that. I know, but... Karen was very, very specific and gave me four very specific things, but before we get to those, I'd love to hear some of your early influences. Um, do you want to see, uh, show the clip first? Not yet. Not She's yet. a director. <laughs> Would you like me to? You know what? You're in control. Well, we can see this. going to warm up things okay, here. Okay. So, yeah. yes. This is uh, okay. Midnight Run, is it? Okay. Let's see Midnight Run. If we can. Thank you. 
Can't you take a joke? No, let's talk some more. Get the fuck out of here. If I hear anything, I'll let you know, okay? Have a nice day. I don't know if you guys could hear that. We couldn't hear it that well, but can you all hear? Could yeah. David, yeah? yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, so, um, hi. Um, it's weird you talked before about the Decalogue because I think inspiration is a big word, but basically it's the chemistry reaction between you in a certain point in your life and a big source or something really strong. And the outcome of this meeting brings up inspiration. And this film I saw, I was 19 years old. I served in the army and my job was to, in the first year to sit almost the whole night in front of a telephone that never rang. That was my job. And it really actually rang once, but at three o'clock it was this guy looking for his girlfriend. Basically a whole year I sat and the telephone didn't ring. And what we, we couldn't do anything. I wanted to read, I said, I'll read Kafka, I'll, I'll take the time, but I was um, getting asleep after three sentences and said, who am I fooling? No one will come in to see I read Kafka, just have fun. And then I brought, we had a VCR with tapes and I brought all these really uh, movies that I wanted people to think how intellectual I, I am and I saw there all the Decalogue. I must say in Hebrew translation, they wrote in the beginning what, uh, it's not murder, yes. So they left us without, yeah. And one day I found this tape, it was written Midnight Run, and it was said, very recommended, ta, 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 three. Now the guy, I knew his handwriting, I really thought he was stupid, because I brought the Decalogue, but him, but I put it in the VCR, and I had a one and a half hour of the joyous time in my army. And I was laughing and I was excited. And I think what I understood there is the quality of playfulness. All the people in that film, they had the joy of playing. They really believed in the game. And they were, uh, they lost distance. You know, there's a term in child development, losing the distance or uh, getting the distance free. You, you can believe you are Almonzo Mosley, you can believe you're, the, the director believed, the script writer believed, and I think that really taught me about, um, you know, the license to play, to really play in the game, and we, when we were little, we, some of us played too seriously, and all the other kids laughed at us, but now as a grown-up, you have a license to play, to really believe you're in this well, you're script, creating yeah. these worlds. Exactly. And uh, that I saw in this film, and I remember I said, wow, this is, I can still be a child as a grown up, and people will say it's okay, and I won't be weird, and I can be in my world. And I will always remember Almanza Mosley for this, uh, whoever, you took off the best part. I, yeah. You, okay. Damn it. Giddy, giddy. Yeah. Yes. So, early influences. By the way, we were going to play The Sound of Music. But we don't have the clip, so we're gonna. Would you like your clip for? Um, I actually chose Sound of Music just because I wanted to see it. I haven't seen <laughs> it in a long time, so. <laughs> and I really, you really owe tried me. to get it, but we couldn't again with Yentl and the Bible. It was hard. It was well, hard. let's first make sure everybody knows. I too have seen Decalogue and liked it. Wow. Um, well done, Tim. How about that? <laughs> um, I think, like Tim said, this is a very hard question, and and that's why we scattered when you asked it. It's, 
it's um, either pretentious to answer it or, or if you're truthful and then if you're not truthful, it's, it becomes a joke. And, and the truth is that I don't know. I know that I, I um, read and read a lot everything and saw everything and heard everything and, and I don't know what I go into. I know these things are in my subconscious and, and I, I can give you a list of movies and books and plays that I love. I don't know if those are the places I go to when I write. Um, and that's the, the most honest answer I can give you. Um, yeah. Okay, so if we show, I did choose Eastern Promises, if I show that. That's, oh yeah. That's, that was one of yours. Is this what's next? Genuinely don't know when this clip finishes. Is it soon? Are we good? Yeah. I think we're good. I think we're good. Maybe. I think. Want to see what happens? I know you were enjoying the naked killing. I, I think by by, so by showing this best. specific <laughs> clip, you've established both that I'm gay and love violence, <laughs> um, which is true. <laughs> I <laughs> definitely have both in my work. What's that? <laughs> it's the best naked fight scene It's I've the ever best seen. fight scene, I think, in, in period. Um, so I love this movie, yeah. I love his movies. Lovely. Okay. So was that the end of that? We're going we're gonna to have a quick clip actually moving away from gay violence into the Twilight Zone, which Tim, you did mention, was actually one of the things that you said was that you didn't watch a lot of TV early on, but these, this is one of the things that really stood out for you, as it did. I mean, I, that rings bells because it still gives me the creeps and I will wince as we watch. Very short clip, but, yeah. but that is interesting to me, obviously, with, with how you create and what you create. Yeah, and I don't, I'm, I'm not sure how to quantify why it was, it, I mean, as I said, I didn't watch a ton of TV. We didn't have uh, a TV. We did have a TV, but it was in my parents' room, so that was not the easiest place to watch TV. But um, I just remember that the whole, uh, the idea of, of being lost into a different world each episode, I think was really fascinating to me. And to be honest, I've always longed for, uh, to be able to create television in a kind of anthology way and wish that that, that was uh, a viable form of storytelling nowadays, you know? Yes. Because I, I just love the idea that, uh, you know, rather than, uh, I love serialized storytelling as well, but for very different reasons. But I like the idea in a writer's room of being able to 
to have it almost like short stories that people can go off and come back with their own inspiration. And I think one of the things about inspiration that we, uh, I was thinking about is it, it's a, in Hollywood, only the, in television, uh, it's not a stock and trade. Inspiration is not that necessary for a lot of writers. Um, you work on somebody else's show, and I think a more viable skill or a more viable thing to draw on is the ability to be a forger, to like to be able to copy sty the style of the show or the sh style of the showrunner, and you may be able to draw an inspiration on a scene or small little moments within this show, but for the most part, you're not drawing on this deep well of inspiration when you when you write. And there's something very powerful about the idea of an anthology where where you know writers could really, uh, like I said, draw from write write like short stories. And it's interesting because, yeah, it's true. You, you have to be able to blend styles, but also you three, as you sit on stage, are original storytellers. You tell your stories, you tell them within the characters and the families that you create in three very different versions of your most successful product that, that obviously we all know and love. Um, okay, so if we move on then, you, you, you're writers, you've started, you've, you've bravely decided to shut yourself in a room with a blank screen and a blank piece of paper and do whatever it is. and, and take your hearts out and allow other people to rip it to pieces or hate it or love it and and um, did your influences change as you did that K Karen I'm gonna come to you because we we gonna look at Raging Bull which is was another of your influences and slightly further along in your career further back in your career okay but we but can we watch it anyway I see, you mentioned before that I gave a specific list, I think is because truly I see inspiration as a matter of time and place that me specific was at that moment. And there was probably a place in my heart that could get these films and put it in place. So I guess all kind of, all films in the world inspire you, but this was a specific moment. And this one was, uh, I think I was 11 years old and I don't know how, a couple of friends and me from my class, we went to see this film. And I don't know who are our parents and who was the screener in this hall, but we went to this Kulnoa Kiryat Yovel. There was one cinema in Jerusalem, big as this, with wooden chairs. And the obvious, in the end, we sat there, and I don't know how, but we sat there and we saw this two hours film, and our um, candies were jumping in the mouth. It was very popular then. They just stopped jumping. We were so fascinated from what we saw. And then we came out and we started this argument. The girl said that it was horrible and what a horrible movie and all this fighting. And the boy said it was amazing. And me, I shouted the loudest it was horrible because I wanted to be normal like the girls. And, but deep down I knew I had a special, something happened to me those two hours, and now I need to live with it, why I'm not normal. 
And for really half a month, I, uh, I couldn't sleep. I was really, really bothered. And I think in that point, I started to understand that script writing, I understand it today, later, but I remember these thoughts, is never about the narrative. It's always about something else, bigger in human nature, human DNA, and that I'm okay. It's, I didn't like the fighting. I didn't like the boxer. I still do like this to these scenes. But what I, I got there is a man that is begging for someone to put him a borderline to say, listen, we can hold you, we can stop you, we're not afraid of your strength. And that touched me in a very um, important place at 11. And that's inspiration because somewhere there I identified about human nature and even me, a little 11 year old girl in Jerusalem, very far from this. And I think from there, I always remember it's not about what you see, it's always about human nature and writing is always about uh, DNA, uh, humanity. And I think it's very important as a writer to understand this. That was an excellent answer, I thought. It really was. Yeah. It really was. You can Get call my parents. <laughs> you realize they also like they were very competitive over email, these two, you know, so that, that was very, gen well, she, very generous she, of you. She managed to you. upstage me, I'll yeah, admit it. she did. But I'm going to give you the chance because yeah. you're, you're, I mean, you gave, there are, there are cards and cards of, of Giddy kind of very visual, very, very, I couldn't draw a line through your influence because, because, as you said, because it's, because I it's I think massive. it's absolutely because what I said, I think it's, it's, a, it's an impossible question for me. I don't have... Um, like Karen does and like Tim does, I don't have the movies that I remember watching in the theater and that affected me in a way that... Because that you were a normal me. kid. No, you no, I was, there was nothing I'm normal kidding. about we my childhood. But um, my, my parents are here, they can vouch for that. But um, it's, it's not that, it's all these beautiful movies, um, and I love them all, are amazing milestones, and they tell you about storytelling and human nature and all that, but I'm not sure the word inspiration is the right word for me in that sense. So it's, what is the right word? Do you I think, think education or, uh, or, you know, I think for me, people inspire me. Um, not so much acts of goodness inspire me. Um, so life, life, the, yeah. your life and, yes. and the life. So, okay, so doing and that. When I, when I do close the door and I'm sitting in front of that um, blank screen, which is the, the scariest feeling in the world, I don't think about Raging Bull or Eastern Promises or, or, or Dumbo. Um, it's, it's more about um, those emotions, that, 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 that influx of all of those things together that, that brought you to this place to tell the story you want to tell right now. And it could be um, something that I saw in an animal shelter, and it could be something my sister told me that doesn't leave me from the age of three, and it could be Raging Bull. But it's, it's a very subconscious, not specific thing that I can pinpoint. I, I mean, talking personally... That was a pretty good answer. That was too. a very good answer, Giddy. Very, very good answer, Giddy. No, I agree. You're all... <laughs> um, I mean, my... my oh, it's not really a question to you. But, but I, oh, I want to okay. say, sorry, that I think it's nice what you two do, and now I feel bad for myself, that you insist on being very accurate and very truthful with yourself and not just bullshit and give a list. And I think also that's about writing, to insist on your really um, accurate feeling. But that so. is what all of, th certainly the three your, of the, the things that people will know you for do for me as a viewer and, and as someone, I, I watch them as a person, as a mother and a child and a sister and a brother and, you, and I kind of hate all of you whilst watching them because, because you screw with me and you, you, know, you take apart my heart as I'm watching them and I'm sitting, obviously sitting at my desk at Keshet crying and, and, or at home crying because, because of course life inspires you and because of the way you, you, you have a talent. Um, I would like to... I, we're not going to go a little bit over time, but I kind of want to... Karen, you mentioned that there are also lots of things that do not inspire you. I'm going to go a bit negative here, and things that make you angry, which is also part of, of a process, really, that you respond against the things. So that, I do... I am throwing that question at you. Can you give me examples of some of that sort of negative side of influences? Germans. I'm kidding. 
I'm kidding. <laughs> no? I'm happy if we don't want to go negative. No, because it just I interests think me. it's the same as saying that inspiration is when you meet something that works on you. It was a private uh, chat like Yentel. Right? Oh, I'm, okay, <laughs> that's good. I mean, I th th uh, okay, I'm going to... I don't know if you've got an answer, but as a, as a program maker, I hate being manipulated in an empty fashion. It's very easy to make me cry. It's very easy to make me laugh. If the writing is not good and you're doing it because that's what you want and that's the effect, that infuriates me and I will turn off my set and I will throw something at the screen. Um, and I think those influences as, as things that I want to make and how I want to inspire the writers I work with, those things inform me possibly more than the things that I love that, mm -hmm. that move me. And I guess, so, no, you don't have to be negative. Okay, so um, uh, we, will, we will sort of begin to come to the end. I would love to know, you sit here, we're, we're in the present day, you do what you do, you inspire people, you are on stage here, and people are gonna be listening. I would absolutely like to pin you all down to see what would you like to think, or how would you like to think that your work inspires a new generation of creatives because they're out there and we're all out there and everyone's got storytelling so if I was to say to you Tim either heroes or you or what's in your head now how would you like to think there's an impact on somebody who's sitting down to write or create oh it's a, it's a terrible question I know yeah it's a really terrible because I, I listen I'm, I, I, I'm still know. amazed that I actually you know have a career and that anybody wants to listen to anything that I that I say so you know I'm I'm sort of humbled by the idea that, that that there's even an audience out there let alone you know wanting to have them impacted by something that I that I do but I do you know in the last dozen years or so I have really been thinking a lot about a kind of like the bully pulpit of having a, a lot of eyeballs watching something that I would make and I think about that and I and I um, I want to try to use narrative to create and promote some kind of positive change in the world and it's it's a fairly non-specific you know I don't have anything I'm really preaching about or uh, but there is a general idea about interconnectivity and the idea of people's lives connected to one another that has been a, a part of my work for for a while now and, um, you know, I want to elevate that as a discussion, so I guess that's, that's what I want I'm to... I'm kind of giving you the license to, to do something that I know it's not, it's not about being humble. So instead of, I'm not saying so, inspire the masses, then the people that you work with, the people that you're going to keep working with, you when you're on set with, mm -hmm. with, your, with your cast, when you're in the edit suite, when you're doing what you're doing, I, I guess it's the values with which you, you come to work every day. You, you work with other people. And I think it's about... Um, if you're talking about the people we work with, it's about a truth. I think um, the most moving times I've had on, on the set of Prisoners of War, which is, you know, a, a small budget, um, is watching an amazing crew working day and night with amazing actors trying to, to get to this um, truth. And they're all working very, very hard um, and not, paying, not being paid enough. And, and um, so I think that inspires me, actually, um, oh, to see everybody work. Yeah. Karen, just, just a word. Uh, um, maybe, again, the playfulness thing. Think that if you're on set and you say, okay, come in, only people really are willing to play with all their hearts, and cynicans out, and, and um, cool people out, just, you really, we want to play, and we want to be, three years uh, still, and we believe in this, and we have fun, and we, uh, we're really playing, and this is what I wish for myself, so that I can continue working with these people that want to play and believe in the license of playing, I think. I heard um, the writer of uh, the, the British show Broadchurch, Chris Chibnall, who's a, who's a really great writer and has had this great hit this year. He, mm -hmm. he said something wonderful, that he'd had a really bad experience on another show and he sat down to just create Broadchurch, not for anyone, just with his editor, almost as a sorry for the last thing that he brought her onto. And they had a very, very strict no wankers policy, not going to work with anyone who's a wanker at any point along the way. And I think a little bit of that policy made it onto screen, and that's why it was so great. And, and I, I know I, I, it wasn't a nice question, but I think on the basis of what you create and how it comes out, 
I think those were three very inspirational answers. And I want to thank you for letting me scatter you and thank peep you. into your heads and your hearts, really.